I've got a fancy mic here that I've never used before. Is this one working? Two mics. Should I take this off or? They'll figure the rest of it out. Yeah. Okay, okay. I can't, you mean I can't walk around anymore? I, I gotta stay right here? No. <laughs> All right. So I wanna go ahead and dive into scripture this morning. So let's turn over to John 11. John 11, and I'm gonna start in verse 1. John 11, verse 1, it says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He is from Bethany, the village of Mary, and his sister Martha. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And let's skip down to verse 11. It says, After he had said this, he went on to them. He went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And let's skip down to 21. It says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would, sorry, my uh, computer is freezing all right, we're good, we're good. Uh, in 21, it says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into this world. Let's stop there just for a second. Jesus is on another level. He's talking about, your brother will rise again. I'm the resurrection, the life. He's saying he's just sleeping. He'll wake up. He's saying these things, and I think Jesus says things like that to us sometimes. And we don't understand. We don't realize that he has the ability to raise people from the dead. And we see here that they, they were like, yeah, he's going he's gonna to come back. He's going to rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Nowhere were they thinking, Jesus is about to bring him back from the grave. I know if I was there, I would not have thought that at all. But we know what Jesus does. So let's go in, uh, skip on down. We see in 35 that Jesus wept. Jesus knew he was going to bring him back from the grave, but he still felt their pain. He still was right there with them. In 38, it says, Jesus once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. He said, take away the stone. The Lord said, Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. We serve a God who has the ability to bring people back from death. We serve a God who can revive people who are dead. Do you believe that? Do you believe that that is the God that we serve? I thought about going back and kind of summarizing and explaining the story, but my words don't do it justice. I'm just going to read some of the things that Jesus says. In verse 4, he says, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. In 23, he says, your brother will rise again. In 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. 
do you believe this? And 40 said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you are always near me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here. And they may believe that you sent me. And 44, he says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. God is the God of healing. He's the greatest reviver. He has the ability to conquer our physical ailments, the things in our life that I'm sure if I asked you all to share a story, you know someone who've heard something that God did something that doesn't make sense. He does things that we don't understand, just like he does here. He says, he is the life. You will never die. We hear these stories. I think probably everyone in here knows the story of Lazarus. Do you believe this? I think sometimes we forget it and we're still wearing our grave clothes. We forget that we've been revived. I want you to think right now, what are times in your life that Jesus has shown you healing or shown you life? Maybe it was when you became a Christian. I don't know what it is for you. My parents are here, so I told them I'm going to share a little bit because I want to embarrass them. Well, try to. I probably won't. I'll probably end up embarrassing myself is what's going to happen. Um, my parents are incredible. If you know me at all, you know that I'm a big knucklehead, especially when I was younger, and they put up with me. <laughs> I'm so grateful for them. My brother is here, too. He can probably uh, tell a lot of stories, how I annoyed the mess out of him. Um, my parents are incredible, and I'm so grateful that they're here. Um, and along with Shelby... I feel like our family has faced a lot of hard times the past four years. I knew I was going to do this. <laughs> well, he's my dad, but he's also my brother, so, you know. Um, there's been a lot of illnesses and death that I didn't see this story Friends my age who died. Family who was sick. And my dad. They're, they're, he, I don't even know why I'm crying. His dad's right there. Um, <laughs> dad was feeling pain and tingling in his hands, and he went to the doctor. And basically they said, you know, we need to operate tomorrow or you get paralyzed or worse. I remember praying God, please don't take my dad from me. God is greater than anything we can imagine. God is the God of healing. And I want to show you just how awesome God is, Jerome, if you could play this video. Hey, wait, play it one more time, one more time, one more time. Make sure everybody saw it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <If you're laughs> oh, man. If you notice, he's still wearing the neck brace. Like he had surgery. He's so crazy. He shouldn't be doing that. Um, <laughs> my parents have been an example through my whole life of what it is to remember things like this. And I know it hasn't been easy. And they told me not to like sugarcoat it, but they are incredible. They have been through things that I hope no one has to go through. And I see this crazy video of them dancing and all the stuff they've gone through. They are not wearing their grave clothes. They are revived. So many of us in here have stories similar to that. I'm going to ask you, how big is your God? Do you believe your God is big enough to heal you? And I think we have a lot of stories, but I want to focus on today is the reason for revival. And that's Jesus. And I'm going to read some, some passages when Jesus talks about his own revival. Let's go look at John 2. It 
So John 2, verse 18. This is right after the, the famous story where Jesus clears the temple courts. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? The temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Let's look at John 10, verse 17. John 10, 17, it says, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. What a God we serve. And what's crazy, I was looking and I wanted to read all of the passages where God talks about how he's going to, or Jesus, he talks about how he's going to die and come back. There's over 20 times that he talks about in the gospel accounts. And I looked at the times that he he talks about how he is the resurrection, he is the life. Almost every chapter, Jesus is reminding his disciples, I am life. I'm going to die and I'm going to come back. He kept reminding them in Matthew 28, verse 6. We know it says, he is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Last week, um, you guys were here. You heard an awesome lesson that Mike did. And he talked about Jesus. He took us to the foot of the cross. He really did. He talked about how Jesus overcame the darkness. He went through the darkness for us. And through that darkness, he came back and he is alive. And then we see he is risen. And I was thinking, man, why did Jesus keep saying that he was going to die? They're always like, what are you talking about, man? Like, what? you're not going to die. They, they didn't understand. Why did Jesus keep saying that he would die and he would come back? Even with Lazarus, he was raising Lazarus from the dead, and he was talking about he was the resurrection. He keeps bringing it up. But even his disciples miss it. The guys he walked with, his friends, the guys who they saw him heal people, blind people, People with leprosy, people who are crippled, crazy, people literally bringing someone back from the dead. Why does he keep rem- reminding them? They need to be reminded. The disciples need to be reminded. How much more do we need to be reminded? We forget that he is the reason. He is why we're here. We serve a God who can't be held by the grave. And I know we know this. I know you guys know this. We hear this. We're in the South. We're in the the buckle of the Bible belt in Tennessee. But I think we forget. Guys, he is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the Prince of peace, the God who revives, the God who gives life. The God who has authority to lay down his life and take it up again. How big is your God? Do you live like he died and came back for you? I want to ask Shelby to come up here and share, actually. Good morning. (laughs) Um, So I'm going to share a little bit about my story and how I saw how big God was in my life. Um, I was reached out to in high school by Parker. Um, I was 14, and he was 16, I think. (laughs) Um, And, you know, I mean, he's the cute guy in the grade above me. I'm just like, oh, yeah, like, great, awesome. Of course I'll come out to church. Um, I was was like, cool. And so I did. And when I came out, it, it was nothing about him. It was all about the people that I saw and just how God was working through them. They were some of the most loving, the most caring, the most complimentary people I had ever met. And like four people came up and hugged me. And I was like, this is weird. Um, but I was, I was there and I decided at one point, um, we had gone on this retreat. I was like, I want to study the Bible. I want to become a disciple. And in the beginning, I was doing it because of Parker at one point was like, I want a disciple girlfriend. Like, I just, I can't like date you. Like you're like, you're not part of the church. And I was like, oh, okay. So I was like, you know what? All right, I'm gonna study the Bible. Cool. And then it wasn't even, I was like two studies in and Parker had to sit down with me and was like, look, we can't be friends. Like, I'm sorry. Um, I just need to apologize. Um, 
but you need to have a relationship with God outside of me. And so that day we <laughs> stopped being friends. We were, we like looked at each other. And <laughs> <laughs> we weren't talking. We weren't doing anything. And he decided to let me um, have my own relationship with God. And I could not thank him enough for that at this moment. I didn't understand it. I remember crying and being like, you know, like, why is this boy doing this to me? Like, why are you breaking my heart? And I was like, you know what? That's okay. I, through those beginning studies, I was like, I actually want this. Like, this is something I'm really interested in. And I was studying with his mom at this point. And I had to co go to that next study and be like, all right, so this is what happened. She was like, I already know. He already told me. And I was like, okay, well, this is, this is even, <laughs> this is even weirder at this point. <laughs> I was 15 at this time. And I decided, you know what, let's just continue with the studies. I kept studying, I kept studying. I got through my studies and I was like, you know what, I want to be baptized. I decided to do this and I had to go talk to my parents about it. My parents divorced, were married. I have four parents. I call them quadrants. It just makes it easier. <laughs> um, <laughs> I went up to them and I was like, look, I love this church. I want to get baptized. And they were like, no. They said, um, we don't want you to be a part of this church. Um, and that hurt. I was like, I love these people. Like, I'm so excited. They hadn't even been to the church at this point. And I was like, please, like, just let me go and be, become a part of this church. <laughs> me being 15, I was like, you know what? I'm going to fight for it. I love God, and I want to get baptized. I want to be a part of this family. And so I sat all four of my parents down with my teen ministers. I set up this whole meeting, and we sat down, and we just talked about the church. And we talked about what I was going to be doing whenever I decided I was going to get baptized with this church. We sat down. They talked. And in that moment, they, you were like, okay, you can get baptized. And if it wasn't for that moment, like, I wouldn't be standing here. Me at 15, sitting my four parents down with these people they had never met, ever, sat down with them and said, my God's greater than this. I got baptized. It was such a, such a great baptism. My four parents were there. My brother, he was away, and he even FaceTimed in. He was, he was in Korea. Um, and FaceTimed in and crying, sharing to me. And we had people from my mom's church who came to my baptism with the other, you know, I'm getting baptized into another church, but that church even came and was supporting me in this decision. Even though I was baptized, I really wanted to respect my mom and her decision because the whole reason I wasn't, like one of the biggest reasons I wasn't allowed to go to this church is because I was in her church. I was involved I was a Sunday school teacher. I was doing all these things. And she was like, I don't want you to leave that. Like, I don't want you to stop doing this. So every Sunday for almost a year, <laughs> I woke up. I went to my mom's church at 830, served the kids, did Sunday school. And then the Helton family came and picked me up at 930. And I went to the Nashville church. And I got there at 10 and did that church service for myself. And I wouldn't, wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't see how big God was in my life. I'm sure if I ask people to share, everyone has heard stories or has their own story of times that they went above and beyond because they saw how big God was. They saw that they wanted to be revived. And I think these stories can be very inspirational and so encouraging, but Jesus is the reason. I'm so grateful that Shelby didn't do it for me because that would have not gone well. <laughs> she did it for God. And I want to share a text that I received while I was getting ready for this message. I received it from a very wise woman named Mom. Um, and I want to, sh she, said, she said not to talk about how awesome she is, but she, this is literally what she texted me. She said, listening to God a lot lately, and it put it in me to reach out to you. Why? Um, whatever your topic is about in your sermon this Sunday, don't forget to tell your audience why you love Jesus and how he changed you. Seems like I've heard a ton of relationship, body, one another, um, discipline, discipleship, church messages lately. And while all those things are a must and important to who Jesus was, 
it's ultimately meaningless unless I'm at the foot of his feet while on the cross realizing I do not deserve this kind of mercy. Love you, Mom. (laughs) We have life through Jesus. It's not through me. It's not through a leader in the church. Guys, we don't have formal leaders in Knoxville. And that's okay right now. We serve Jesus. It doesn't matter if we're able to hire a new couple. We serve Jesus. We're here for Jesus. I, worship was incredible today. And we have some talented people, but we don't serve them. We serve Jesus. We're revived because of him. Jesus is the God who has revived people. He's the God who has been revived. The last thing I want to share is he can revive you. It is time for your revival. I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you've been a Christian for 50 years. It's time to step up. (laughs) What do you need to change? What do you need to do? John 14, 12. You don't have to turn. I'll read it real quick. I know I'm running out of time. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I'm going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask anything for me in my name, and I will do it. Jesus is the reason. He can bring people back from the grave. He himself conquered the grave, and he says we can do greater things than these. Do you believe that? I think sometimes we don't believe that because we're holding on to things in the past. Hurt, fear, leadership we didn't agree with, other religions, other churches. And this is what I have to say about that. Burn the boats. Some of you know what that means. Some of you are like, man, this guy's crazy. What is he talking about? Burn the boats. Historical context, we have conquerors that honestly did some pretty bad things. Um, Like Hernan Cortez, Alexander the Great, they literally burned their ships at the shore because they said, we're not going back. We're winning. There is no retreat. I think some of us still have our boats on the shoreline. I think that's why a lot of people have left the church, not just our church, all churches during COVID. We had a way out. What's holding you back from burning those boats? Because let me tell you right now, we're not here to serve each other. If we serve each other, we're all going to be hopping in the boats, leaving. (laughs) We serve God. We serve Jesus. We serve a Jesus who has conquered the grave. What ways do you need to be revived? Maybe it's sharing your faith. When we were in France, there was a a church of 14 people. We had 50-year-old plus out there sharing their faith with us. 14 people in this church, and they sacrificed their jobs, careers, dreams even, because they're like, God is more important. Working full-time jobs still out there, sharing their faith in the middle of the city. Maybe it's sharing your faith. Maybe it's reading your Bible more. Maybe you haven't had the meaningful relationship, quiet time, times with God as as you used to have when you said Jesus is Lord. Maybe it's your one another relationships. Maybe there's sin in your life. Maybe there's impurity. Whatever it is, whatever those things are that you need to work on, whatever those things are you've been holding on to, maybe COVID brought something up and it's still there. You can't burn the boats without being revived with Jesus. It's impossible. We can't do it without Jesus. No inspirational story. As awesome as my parents are and as awesome as Shelby's story is and as awesome as some of you guys have these stories, it's Jesus. Jesus didn't die and come back so that we could hold on to our past and not be revived. I have one last scripture, and I'm so grateful for what Victor shared. If you guys could go ahead and hand out. Uh, I, have a little, I have a little gift for you guys. No, don't get too excited. Uh, <laughs> it'll be a very meaningful gift that I want you to keep with you and take with you and be able to look at. You guys can go ahead and turn to Matthew 17. And again, I haven't read anything necessarily new today. These are things we're familiar with, things that we know. But I want to remind you guys. So Matthew 17 and verse 20. This is right after Jesus is healing, or he healed a demon-possessed boy that the disciples couldn't heal. 
Matthew 17, verse 20. Did you guys, uh, yes, it's a mustard seed. You know where I'm going. Um, Matthew 17 and 20. He replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Do you believe this? How are you going to be revived? What can you change? I want you guys to look at the seed. Hopefully everyone has one by now. I gave everyone a a little pinch of them. I'm holding it up here, and you probably can't even see what's in this bag. <laughs> it, they're so small. That is all it takes. A decision right now. I don't know what it is in your life. I don't know what it needs to be. How can your relationship with Jesus be revived? And I think as awesome as that is, I think there's kind of a, the flip side of this that we can let a mustard seed of doubt, bitterness, fear, or hurt get in the way of our revival. Just as easily as a mustard seed of faith can change your life and someone else's, it can really hurt your life and keep you from growing closer to God and growing this family that we have here. This applies to everyone. I don't care if you've been here since Jesus walked this earth. It applies to you, all right? If you haven't decided to, to follow God with your whole heart yet, this still applies to you. And I want you guys to keep that with you because we have a choice each day to be revived because of Jesus. And I honestly, I, I may have said something you didn't agree with today. And I'm glad that you're not here for me. It's for Jesus. <laughs> Let this mustard seed be a reminder of how big your God is. I know it's small, but that's how big God is. God is so big that he can use something this small to move a mountain through you. What is it going to be for you? Now, this is Parker's opinion. Some may not agree with me. I think the church is in the perfect place right now to be revived. People to be revived, to take ownership, to step up, to preach, to sing, to lead. We don't have formal leaders in the Knoxville church. I'm so grateful for you guys visiting. A lot of you guys come from smaller churches. What better way to step up? What better way to be revived? What can you do to grow? What can you do differently? It's just a mustard seed. Let's be revived and let's choose revival. I love you guys. Amen.